soil health is is extremely, extremely important. And we'll talk a little bit about that. But I first just need to clear the air. You'll see on my opening slide that I have a, a little statement down there. And some of the folks that do have been around me for the past year, year and a half, are probably chuckling a little bit because I have a pet peeve. And my pet peeve is when I talk to people about soils, they refer to it as dirt. And as I've got there, dirt is not soil and soil is not dirt. Dirt, there is something that is actually dirt, but it's not a value. It can't be gardened, it can't be farmed. Um, only soil is that true living environment that plants and animals and we as humans thrive on. So um, I always try to be a little diplomatic and, and persuade people to use the word soil rather than dirt, but um, it's, it's in the popular press. In fact, well, I'll wait till I get to that slide, but um, a little background on myself. Um, I have, uh, I've been retired for the past three years, but I spent uh, my entire career in agriculture. Um, I spent 20 years in the agricultural seed business. I was an agronomist, which is a plant and soil science person with a plant and soil science background. Uh, when my kids were young, they referred me as, or referred to me as the corn doctor. So I guess that's how it was perceived in their eyes. Um, I, as I mentioned, I did that for about 20 years and then I decided that uh, changed my career a bit and I went into the agricultural machinery equipment, um, but was involved with all the new technology that's now on uh, tractors, combines, just about everything and I'll, I'll mention that a little bit. But really, probably the most rewarding part of my career was at the very end. Um, I spent three years as a consultant with another individual and we had a small company. Um, and what we did was we worked with landowners, particularly absentee landowners. And I always hated the word tenant, but many people can relate to the word tenant. I would work with the landowner's tenant as well as the landowner. And our sole goal was to improve soil health through soil conservation measures. Uh, the way it was farmed, the fertility, just everything that was done. And um, if you happen to be an absentee landowner and you have somebody that's farming or working your land, you know, one of the things that's very hard to keep up with technology. So I found that the landowners were a little hesitant to ask questions, um, to maybe be more persistent with their with the people that they had farming. And so I was kind of that conduit in between. And uh, our sole goal was to have a more healthier farm, a more sustainable farm, and, and really just a more productive land um, that the landowner had. So that's a little bit about my career. Um, what I'd like to do is share with you, there we go. Um, the agenda, the topics that I'd like to cover tonight, real quickly, talk about this soil, soil health concept. Um, the actual term is relatively new. It's been out there for probably the last 15 years. Um, I also want to share with you taking inventory of your soils. And it doesn't make any difference how large or how small an area we're talking about it's still important that we know what we're working with in order to accomplish what we all wanna do and that's improve it. And one of those ways is soil testing. So I will spend time on that. Talk about what you'll learn from a soil test. I won't cover all of the soil chemistry things, just primarily the basics. And then as Molly mentioned, I'm gonna share with you just a very small case study of what I did at the Cable Community Farm last fall, what we learned from it, and some of the kind of ahas that came out of it. And then uh, how you manage what you measure. 
Um, we all have heard that term before, and we'll go into just what you can do to improve soil health. Okay, so let me start with this. Uh, what is soil health? You can see the official um, definition of it at the bottom, but, but really what we're talking about is a more holistic approach and a more sustainable look at the plant community, how it interacts with all of the components of soil and not only soil, but the ecosystem because all of this works together. A lot of times we focus on just what's above ground, but we forget about the amazing, amazing chemistry and living activity that's going on in that soil below our tomato plants, our blueberry plants, or our pine trees. And really that's what soil health is. It's putting all of this information together and taking a look at how we can improve it. And I'll start off just with a, just a very brief history, but I think we can really look to our, our indigenous brothers and sisters as probably the very first that truly practiced soil health. They were what I call precision farmers. A lot of us think of Native Americans that they lived in the forest and they harvested deer and that, they were really farmers and they were excellent farmers and they knew how to practice sustainable uh, practices in order you know, to have the food that they needed as well as to take care of the land. Um, I think one of our board members and also the uh, person that's um, in charge of our other portion of our farm, Liz, um, she has been practicing um, a system that goes back to our Native American days called Three Sisters. And this is simply an area where you plant corn, you plant beans, and you plant squash. So why those crops? Well, first of all, maize was quite important to the indigenous people. Second of all, the beans, they realized that they fertilized the corn Beans are a legume, so they provided nitrogen to the corn. It also, the corn was a way for the beans to grow up. They bind on the corn so they are easier to pick. And then the squash down below shaded the ground to hold in the moisture to keep soil temperatures down. Incredible. And this was done, you know, way back. So I look at that as really the start of soil health. And you take a look at the middle picture, that's when a lot of us started to um, kind of break the system down. And of course, that's the Dust Bowl when we broke the prairie. And all we were concerned about is how many acres could we plow to sustain our farm, our family, and we all know the outcome of that. So we've been trying to recover ever since then. The far picture on the right is not something that's um, um, what am I trying to say? It's, it's a very typical picture in today's pro, pro, um, productive agriculture. This is a farmer sitting in his cab. It almost looks like a spaceship. I've been in some of them where you can barely look out the window, but each one of those screens is providing him with information, whether it's telling him where the seed and how much seed is being placed, where he's placing his fertilizer. My point is technology has really come to play and, and it has been very significant when we take a look at the role of soil health. And so a lot of the reason that we're able to get to the point that we are with soil health is because we're now looking below the soil surface at the micro level and better understanding uh, plant and soil interactions, and we're doing it. We're doing it because we can. So let's start with one of the very basic things, and that is your soil. I look at soil as a bank account, and we all can relate to that, hopefully in a positive way. But if we take a look at soil has got, just like our bank account, you have so many dollars in that account. If you continue to spend it, if you continue to use it, 
eventually what happens? You're in the red. It has to be replenished one way or another. Our soil is exactly the same way. We're all fortunate to start at some point that we have nutrients in our soil. In some cases, we have more nutrients than in other cases, but we're starting with nutrients there that we're able to let the plants utilize. But we need to be careful. We need to pay attention to it because just like your bank account, if we're not careful and we don't replenish the soil, all of a sudden we're in the red. Our produce no longer is productive and there's a lot of other harmful things that happen. You can't manage what you can't measure. And that's what we'll talk about here next because when it comes to being able to manage our soil and our soil's health, it really starts off with assessing where are you at and the best way to do that is to start with soil testing. So let me start talking a little bit about the very process of, of a soil test, and that is the sampling itself. The tools of the trade are pretty simple. Uh, you'll see there on my bucket, that's a soil probe if you've never seen it. Um, in a lot of cases, they've become obsolete. You can buy them at farm auctions because farmers have turned that that uh, process over to the co-ops or suppliers. But a soil probe, a trowel, a shovel, a bucket, and then bags in which you're gonna put your samples in. The bags can be supplied either by the soil testing lab that you're working with, or just simply plastic Ziploc bags are, for, will work as well. The most important part is that you take very close attention to how you sample your soil. And we call it a composite sample because that sample is, is only going to be a small, small assessment of the overall amount of soil that you have, whether it's in a garden plot, a field, your lawn, whatever it might be. So doing a good job of taking that sample is important. How often? About every three to four years is a pretty good rule of thumb because you'll be interested, it takes that long for you to start seeing changes. And you'll be interested to see what changes you made, how that's impacted the next soil test that you take. And then the other part of sampling is that you wanna make sure that if you do it in the spring of the year the first time, that the next time you sample, you do it at the same season. Random sampling procedure. This is just simply probably the most go-to um, systems out there, procedures. If you're doing it yourself, you just walk in a zigzag pattern. And at each point, you'll stop and you'll take a, you'll uh, take your trowel or your probe and you'll pull about 10 to 15 samples in that spot. Then zigzag in another direction, do the same thing. But in each one of those locations, I strongly recommend that you take around 10 to 12 samples. And also that you take those samples at six inches. Like on my soil probe, you can't see the back of it, but I have a piece of duct tape that when I push that probe into the ground, I know I'm taking it down six inches. You can do that with a shovel or a trawl as well. But typically six inch depth is what's recommended for soil sampling. Then you put it in the bucket, you mix this all together, and that's what you're gonna go into your soil sample bag. So again, make sure that you mix it quite well. That sample then will be sent to a lab and I have the word certified there. There's many, many soil testing labs. I can't even begin to tell you the types of labs that I've seen. Some of, our, some of them are in the basement of a house. Um, anybody can get into soil sampling. I recommend that if you're going to do it, make sure you do it by a certified lab. Why certified? Because they're required annually to send in samples to the, whatever the local university is. And the university will sample it and then they'll get the results and they'll check that against the results of the lab that you're using. And so they, think they keep things calibrated very well and they're very, very reliable. So that's why 
I just wanted to mention about using a certified lab if you're going to do it. And you can go out on the web and you can Google certified soil testing labs in Wisconsin and Minnesota, and you'll get a listing of those labs. All right, so you've taken your sample. You sent it into the lab. About three weeks later, you get this couple pieces of paper together. And believe me, if it's the first time you get it, it can be absolutely overwhelming. There's all these numbers that for a lot of us really don't make a whole lot of sense. But again, if you're using a certified lab, they will provide you excellent information about what it means. But basically, what it's going to show you is a sample. It's going to have a sample number or numbers, depending on how many samples you send in. And for each of those samples, you're going to get a reading on organic matter. And I'm going to talk about these in more detail. Phosphorus, potassium, nitrate, nitrogen, and a whole host of other micronutrients. And then also that soil test lab will also provide you recommendations on what you need to apply. If you tell them that it's for a garden, they will send you back recommendations on how much of that nutrient needs to be applied, or maybe it doesn't need to be applied at all. And I'll show you an example of that. Because what we don't want to do is we don't over want to, we don't want to overply our nutrients. We all know what phosphorus can do in our lakes. We know what nitrate nitrogen can do in our streams, rivers, and gulfs and oceans. And so what we want to do is, is apply the amount of fertilizer that's either going to help you build your nutrient level, or if you're at a high enough level, what we call, you'll have a maintenance program where you'll just put on enough to maintain that good level that your soil test comes back at. But again, the soil test lab will provide that information. And I should also mention, um, soil test labs generally will come back with their measurements as parts per million or PPM. What does that mean? Most of us can relate to pounds per acre. So you just take that PPM number multiply it by two, and that will give you how many pounds per acre you need to apply. That's just a standard, goes back to the early days when soil test labs first started. All right, I wanna talk about a couple important things here that you'll get information on your soil test. I can't overemphasize enough, when we talk about soil health folks, our big focus is around the organic matter. And some areas are blessed. I reside, my, my home residence is in Iowa. Uh, obviously, it being a farming state, we're blessed with soils that have been taken care of, that organic matter levels are wonderful. Um, here in the North Country, where we're dealing with clays and sands, that may not be the case. But the important thing to know is this is where all the goodies are. This is where all the activity takes place. That's why we want to guard so much to maintain and to improve the organic matter in our soils. As you can see, there's three components that make up organic matter. Most of it is dead plants and dead plant parts. Then we also have the living parts, which are mainly the roots that are in there. And then we've got microbial organisms and soil animals, earthworms, centipedes, all of those things. That's what makes up our organic matter. Just to give you an example, if you get your soil test back and it says that your organic matter is at 2%, keep this in mind that for every percent of organic matter, you already have in your bank account 20 to 30 pounds of nitrogen. You already have four to seven pounds of phosphorus. You already have two to three pounds of potassium. That's for every percent of organic matter. That's why it's so important. It sustains life and it provides nutrients. And it's also extremely, extremely important to help water infiltrate the soil as well as keep our soil surface cool. So I think I've said enough on organic matter. All right. The second 
area that I like to, to focus on when I sit down with folks on a soil test, and that's the soil pH, which I'm sure all of you have heard about. Basically, this is a measurement that again is done in the lab, and it measures the acidity or the alkalinity of the soil. Now, again, depending on what materials made up your soil, it can vary quite a bit. Again, if I can revert back to my agricultural days in Iowa, in Northern Iowa, where our, where our soils um, are high in clay content, we have, a, we have a problem with high pH in that it's alkaline. And we'll see reactions to like bean plants will turn yellow where it's extremely alkaline. In other places, it'll be more acidic. Alfalfa, our legume crops, they will not grow in acidic soil. Okay, so what do we want to shoot for? We want to shoot for that, that neutral area. Pretty much all vegetables, with maybe the exception of blueberries, and that's not a vegetable, I'm sorry. But if you would look at what you're growing in your garden, the optimal pH will be between 6, 5, and 7, 6, 8 to 7, somewhere in that range. And why is that important? If you take a look at that bottom chart, if you can see it well enough, the soil pH has a big impact on how available the nutrients in your soil are. You'll notice that as we go to the acidic side or the left side, those bars narrow up, meaning you can have good levels of phosphorus, but the plants can't take it up because of the acidity. At the right-hand side, if, you're, if it's an alkaline soil, Again, the plants just are not able to take that up. So what can we do about it? If we've got an acidic soil, the best thing we can do is use um, aggregated or agricultural lime. Um, in my garden last year, I simply went to l and I bought barn lime. I put barn lime on my soil. There's a number of different sources. You can buy liquid lime, it's expensive. But the point is, we use lime to improve our soil pH, especially when it's on the acidic side. All right, the other uh, one that will be reported is phosphorus, which people generally refer to as P. And phosphorus really has two purposes. Number one, it is essential for root development. Um, it also will help produce more flowers on your plants. It also is a great food source for all the microorganisms. It creates this symbiotic relationship. But as you'll see down below, it's important that we've got soil pH that's in the proper range in order for phosphorus to be available for the plants to take up. The other nutrient is potassium. Now, potassium is one of our major nutrients. And what potassium does, it's very, very significant, just like phosphorus is. But potassium will improve the size of your fruit. It will also help you. And we've, we're experiencing a dry spell. If you have good potassium levels, your plants are going to be more efficient in utilizing whatever water is out there. So potassium it kind of goes unnoticed an, an awful lot of times, but we especially see how effective potassium, good potassium fertility is when we get into dry years. And as I said, you're also with good potassium levels, you'll see larger fruit size, be it tomatoes, peas, whatever it might be. The one nutrient that I I'm not talking about here, and that's nitrogen. Of course, we all know about nitrogen. It's the one that makes the plant green. It allows for photosynthesis to take, take uh, place in the plant. It's an essential macronutrient. The thing about nitrogen when it comes to soil tests, you will get a nitrogen level back, but nitrogen, keep in mind, this is different from phosphorus and potassium. Phosphorus and potassium are very, very fixed on the soil particle itself. Nitrogen, the element, 
is very mobile, meaning that it moves through the soil readily. That's why we get concerned with over nitro, um, over nitro, uh, nitrogen fertilization, getting down through soils and into groundwater, into our streams, into our lakes. It's a very mobile nutrient. So although you'll get a result back on your soil test on nitrate nitrogen, you could pull a sample out of those same spots two days later, especially if you've had a rain, and get a completely different reading just because it's such a mobile nutrient. But don't get me wrong, nitrogen is extremely, extremely important for plant and for soil health. So with that, let me move into just this little case study. Molly mentioned it. Um, I came to the Cable Community Farm a year ago and um, I had garden plot and I got to know gardeners and got to watch all the produce being grown. It's just a, if you haven't been there, it's a wonderful place. The people there are fantastic. Um, the project leaders are so, so passionate about what they do that it, it's just, I just am so proud to be part of it. As I was working there through the summer and working with my little 10 by 30 plot, um, as I've gotten older, I'm a little slower at recognizing things. But finally, it dawned on me, Oh, it was probably early July that my, my, I had uh, pole beans growing. And my pole beans started to yellow up around the leaf margins. And in between the veins, they started to yellow up. Well, I've worked with soybeans my entire career, and it's in the same family. And what that was a sign for me was something was wrong with potassium. And all of a sudden, it dawned on me. Here I am, even though it's a 10 by 30 plot, I have no idea what I'm farming. And so I went to um, the landowner, Katie Hancock, and I asked Katie, would it be possible, would you mind if I soil sampled the cable community farm, not the growing together garden that Liz is in charge of. I, I just wanted to start in this area that we have these 40 years 40 or so garden plots. So I think it was around October after everything was harvested, I went and I sampled the entire cable community farm. Now there's about 40 garden plots. I did a random procedure as I explained before. And when I got done of those 40 garden plots, I had around 25 of them as part of my composite sample. Then I did my own garden plot and I happened to, there was a woman that was there the day I was doing it. I explained to her what I was doing. She said, well, would you mind doing my plot? I said, no, I, that's fine. I'll be glad to, I'm doing it anyways. And there was a, another gardener there that asked me to do it. So I sampled the entire cable community farm area and then three individual plots, including my own. I'll show you the results. So as I mentioned, the soil test came back with a number of other nutrients and micronutrients, but since I've just talked about these, I, I wanted to share with you. So let's take a look at the farm itself. This was the entire area that I collected samples, put it in a composite, put it in a bucket, mixed it all up, First of all, we talk about organic matter, 3.1% organic matter. I was quite surprised to be honest with you, but when you consider the amount of area that I was in, I'm sure I got a lot of garden refuge. I got a lot of compost, but anyways, it is, the number is what it is. But you'll also notice that the soil pH is far below where it should be, that target number of six, eight to seven. The phosphorus level, and you can see across all the four areas that I sampled, our phosphorus levels are all very high. But if you take a look at plot number one, that's my plot. And as I mentioned, I was showing some potassium deficiency on my pole beans. Well, all of a sudden it starts to explain things. 
When we take a look at uh, plot number two and plot number three, you'll see the soil pH is good, higher than the farm. I should mention that I lined my plot about two weeks before I sampled it. So I think part of my 6.5 was, it was reflecting the amount of lime that I put on. But the other two plots were still pretty good. And plot number two was one of the women that's at the farm. She had applied lime and um, you're starting to see a reaction on her plot. I had no information at all on plot number three until I talked to the folks that had, had gardened it this past year. And they told me that it had been limed in the past. Um, there was a lot of composting done, which reflects the 3.6% organic matter, the high organic matter. And look at the phosphorus level, 128 parts per million. Very, very high. So that garden area was well taken care of. And the folks that had it last year, I watched how they took care of it. They took care of it very well. But even with that, you can still see that the potassium levels were low in plot number three. So overall, these are the types of results that you'll get back along with a number of other things. The micronutrients, I just wanted to focus on the main ones. But organic matter is what we're really trying to improve. And that can be done, we'll talk about how we can manage what we measure here in a minute. Okay, so you've taken your soil test, you've got your test results back, you've got over that period of being overwhelmed by the numbers, you're reading what the soil test lab sa says to you about each of um, the, the uh, soil test results. Now what do we start doing about it? And I will mention that this picture up here, uh, that is my plot, that's not fertilizer, but that's that's what it looked like after I spread barn lime on before I worked it in. So again, that was about two weeks before I had taken the soil test. So I had, I had plenty of lime on my garden plot. So there's a number of different ways that, um, that we can take care of amending our soils and improving soil health. Um, first of all, again, I'll go back to the Cable Community Farm. We're strictly organic. And so we've got to rely on things other than commercial fertilizer to raise or maintain our nutrient levels and our soil health. If you're not organically gardening, or if we're talking about a yard, um, berry patch, there's always synthetic or commercial fertilizers that you can purchase. The thing I want to tell you on commercial fertilizers is they're not all the same. Make sure, make sure you read the label. And every bag of fertilizer is required to have a label on what percent of N, P, and K you're going, you have in that bag. What can be confusing to some is when we talk about the nitrogen that's in commercial fertilizer because it comes in different forms. What you want to look for if you're going to use bag fertilizer is you want to use nitrogen that's in the non-water soluble, as high a percentage of non-water soluble form as you can. Typically that's urea, U-R-E-A. If you're fertilizing, putting fertilizer down on your yard, you'll see a vast difference if you use a fertilizer that's got a high wind, water and soluble nitrogen. Your lawn will stay greener longer because it takes longer for it to break down and become available. Same way if you're using it in the garden, but it will have on that bag tag what percent of the different forms of nitrogen. If you're organic like we are, there are options. I can't emphasize enough the importance of compost, but I wanna talk about compost here in just a minute. It is extremely important. If you haven't started a compost pile, start one. You can start it tomorrow if you want. 
grass clippings, leaves, weeds, vegetable scraps, meat scraps. Compost pile is, is a must on, on any garden or acreage. If you're fortunate enough to have access to or have some type of livestock, of course, manure is fantastic. It's got, and it, it'll vary a little bit about what species it comes from, a horse versus sheep versus cows. Um, but no matter what, it adds wonderful nutrients to the soil. It improves the soil health. It improves the soil structure. And you're just feeding all of those wonderful little microbes that are in that organic matter layer. What do I mean by green manure? The picture that you see on the right-hand side is an example of green manure. What I did last fall is after I lined my garden, I seeded it down with a, a crop called winter rye. Winter rye is exactly what it says. It does not die out once it gets hit by frost. It continues to grow. It will uh, continue to put below ground growth. And come spring, it greens back up and it will stool out and become thicker. What I did is, and I'm going to do it differently next year, but what I did was I incorporated it. I, I took a weed whacker, I cut it off, and then I took a rototiller and I tilled that back into the ground. So what did I do? Number one is I had my soil covered all year long. I was feeding the microbes all year long. I also was taking care of weeds. It choked out any type of weeds, especially your fall germinating and winter germinating weeds. It can't compete if you get a good stand of either rye, winter rye or oats. And then all the nutrients that that green crop took out when I rototilled it back in, that's now being broke down and available to my vegetables. The thing is that I'm gonna do different is, I don't like tilling the ground. It ruins the soil structure. I'm going to make an effort next year to no-till right into that meaning, just cut little alleys in between the rye, the winter rye and plant my crops and have a, a mixed crop. This goes back to indigenous ways. That's what they did. They intercrop, they mix crop. But no matter what, a green manure will, will do wonderful things. You can also buy packaged or bagged organic fertilizers. Um, it will distinctly say on the tag or on the bag that it's organic form. And so again, if you're in an organic system, and you don't have access to compost or any of these other um, um, amendments, you can always purchase organic fertilizers. Let me just mention one thing though about compost. Don't take me the wrong way. It's, it's extremely important and it's a wonderful source, but not all compost is the same. The nutrient value of compost will have a lot to do with two primary ingredients. One is what the compost is made out of. And number two, how long has it been composted? The longer that's in that compost pile and the more diligent you are in turning it over and turning it over and mixing it in, when you take that compost out and put it on your garden or your whatever you're using it on, you'll find a much better nutrient level. I pulled some samples and you, you can also have samples taken from your compost pile, send it to a same certified testing lab and they will give you the results of what the nutrient value is of your compost. I hate to tell you it's, it's an expensive, it's not a cheap test. I believe that it cost me about $80 to get the test done. But I was just curious in our compost bin just because so many people use it, you know, what the nutrient value of compost was. So my point is, don't stop using compost, but it's important that you manage it properly and you know what's going in there, what you're taking out. 
the last area I could spend the entire session talking about, and that's on biologics and inoculants. But um, this is kind of uh, evolving. Um, they've been around a while. Uh, there's been a lot of testing done. Um, some of them um, have been worth the money, others haven't. But I think it's going to be one of the biggest breakthroughs that we have on soil health is to be able to use more biologics and more inoculants, whether it be in our fruit trees or in our gardens or what have you. So, and I see Molly's on, so I, I know I've got to wrap it up. So just wrapping it up, um, what are the factors that's gonna give you a good indication that your soil's healthy? Well, all of these, or most of them are gonna stem right back to the soil test. But first of all is you want that stable soil pH, six, five to seven. You want good soil structure. And what does that mean? That means taking a handful of soil out of your garden and it just crumbles in your hand. How can you improve the soil structure? Don't over till, or if you can avoid tillage, that's all the better. Let the microorganisms do the work. They'll break the soil down. They'll develop soil structure for you. I already overemphasized organic matter, but then also going back to our indigenous brothers and sisters, they knew the importance of biodiversity. They planted three sisters where they had three different crops. There's a number of other examples of that, but those only help microorganisms that build up soil health. And as you continue down the road to measure the health of your soil, you follow those things and you'll have my email address. If it doesn't work for you, let me know. So with that, Molly, I'll just, I'll put this up while we ask if there's some questions. Molly asked for some resources. The USDA, NRCS, if you go online, they've got a wealth of information on soil health. There's also recently the Soil Health Institute. Again, you can go online, you can become a member. They have so much material out there that you'll spend all winter long reading the material. But they have come up with their own test. It's called the North America Project to Evaluate Soil Health Measurements. And they've actually got two tiers of measurements and they all relate to soil testing. So if you soil tested, you can compare your numbers to what they've developed in their two tiers. In the state of Minnesota, they've got the Minnesota Office of Soil Health and then the Minnesota Soil Health Coalition. In Wisconsin, I, I hate to say it, but I had to look pretty hard. Um, NRCS, Wisconsin R NRCS, was the only place that I could really find a lot of information on soil health here in Wisconsin. But Molly, just real quick, just let me end real quick because I started with this and I'm ending with it. And that is under one of my resources, I've got a book and it's called Dirt. And if you remember, if you were awake at the beginning of my talk, I told you what I thought of that word. But I ran, a, I picked this book up because of that. It's dirt, the erosion of civilization. Sorry, I've been talking too much. It's a wonderful book if you want to learn the history and what soils have meant to mankind from the very beginning. It's a wonderful book. So, even though I don't especially agree with the title, the information in that book is fantastic. Sorry, Molly. I'm fine, Greg. Thank you so much for that useful information um, on soil, not dirt. Um, it looks like we do have a few questions coming in, and I'll keep monitoring the chat. Ed had two questions he threw in there. So the first one was, um, is the neutral pH level shown on one of those charts um, for vegetables the same as for flowers? It makes no difference. It makes no difference. Really, other than crops such as blueberries, and I would even argue 
people talk about blueberries needing acidic soil because you find native blueberries in the forest where there's pine needles and things. Typically, people refer to blueberries as needing a lower pH. But for the most part, if you can get your soil pH in that 6.5 to 7 range, whether you're growing fruit trees, vegetables, um, flowering shrubs, it, it goes for just about all of, all of the vegetation. Thanks. And Ed's second question was, what was the nutrient value of the Cable Community Farm compost pile? Oh gosh, um, I don't have I don't have it, but I, what I can I, I don't have the numbers, but what I can tell you is that it was low in it was moderate in nitrogen, it was low in phosphorus, and it was low in potassium. But keep in mind, I pulled that. I, I, I would do it differently. I should have gone to Liz, Liz who runs the um, Growing Together Garden. She's got a compost pile that's been there for, I don't know, Liz, three to five years. I should have gone to that. The compost pile I drew my samples was my mistake. I pulled it out of a compost pile that was only there since last spring. So it really wasn't a fair measure because it really hadn't composted enough. I would guarantee you that if I would have pulled it out of Liz's compost pile, we would have had some pretty nice numbers. Just looking at her compost and when she's put it on her flower or her plants, uh, it'd be much different. So um, I, I just, I probably shouldn't have used that example. I just want people to know you can test your compost and, and find out what the nutrient level is so you know how much to put on. Good, que great question. Yeah, that was great. And I'm interested to see how those numbers might change over time as our compost pile, our large pile is reestablished. So that'll right. be really interesting and I hope you continue to test. Um, we had another question come in from Pam and she asked what amendments were recommended for the farm? Uh, for the farm, it was recommended that we put on um, about, and I'm, 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 I'm taking a look at the farm right now. What they recommended was they recommended 120, and this is pounds per acre, um, 125 pounds of nitrogen, no phosphorus, because if you remember, whether it was the farm or whether it was any of the individual plots that I sampled, they were all high in phosphorus. If I would have gotten a soil recommend or a, a soil fertility recommendation for phosphorus, I would highly doubt the credibility of that lab. Um, the particular lab that I used in all three, in all four cases, they did not recommend any phosphorus. Um, and then on potassium, they recommended about 100 pounds of potassium. And that can easily be in, and both of those nutrients can easily be applied with compost, with manure, with any of those amendments that we talked about. Now it does take, and, and that's why I recommend coming back and testing every three to four years. This doesn't happen overnight. These little soil microorganisms that I just love that do all this hard work that are working 24 seven it takes them time to break all of this down. And then again, if you're talking about a soil pH that isn't where it should be, um, those nutrients aren't always gonna be made available. So there's some things that go with that, but that's what the recommendations were for, for the farm. Great, yeah, thank you for that question, Pam. Yes, great question. And it looks like we don't have any more coming in, so I'll slip one of my own questions in. Um, so Greg, you detailed how organic matter, kind of these handheld um, amendments can supply necessary tr nutrients. Um, I'm wondering if you have any thoughts on how um, things like air or water supply might um, either improve or damage soil as sources. Molly, that that is an awesome question. And it, 
I, I had it in my notes, but just because of time, I, I went past it. Um, I'm, a, I'm a true believer that there's global climate change going on. And we can argue whether it's man-made or not. That, that doesn't, that's not the point. The fact of the matter is that climate change is a happening. And I just read a recent article that gives me a lot of confidence if it can only happen in time. And Molly, what you're referring to is heat, like what, we've, what we're currently going through and what we've had here this summer and the poor folks out west of the Missouri River, um, what they're going through all the way to the west coast. What's that doing to our soil? It's burning our soil up. The high temperatures are decimating our organic matter. And we're talking about areas, especially out in the arid west, where organic matters isn't that high to begin with. In Iowa, we're fortunate. We were God-given, you know, parent material that we have four, three to four percent organic matter. Um, but if we continue to get this hot, dry weather, the first effect it's going to have is on the organic matter. It's going to burn. That's going to reduce our microorganisms. And the only thing, if we don't make some changes, we most likely are going to have to change either the plant species that we plant. Um, I mean, consider growing a palm tree rather than a lilac bush here in Cable. I'm just saying that facetiously, but I mean, it, that, that's the concern. But my point is, there's a number of scientists now that have grouped together from around the world that are taking a look at climate change and how it's affecting soil health. If any of you want to go online, Google the Wisconsin Agriculturalist. It's an online magazine primarily for Wisconsin farmers. But this pat last week and this in this past week, they have our, an article there about this research project that's taking place that's assessing the effect of climate change on, on our soil health. There's a lot of answers that are yet, or there's a lot of questions. A lot of answers to be figured out yet, but I'm, I'm encouraged that there's a group of, of scientific people that are taking a look at this. If we can just get information back in time to make the changes. Sure. I, I hope that got at what you were want, getting or your question, Molly. Yeah, and I, I didn't necessarily intend that to be such a huge question, but I appreciate you tackling it quickly. Um, yeah, thanks, Greg. We did have a couple more questions come in at the end. Um, I will leave some room to answer those, but for anyone who does have to leave right at eight o'clock, thank you so much for coming. Um, our next lecture will be Wednesday, July 28th, and Jen Zaspel will be visiting us um, from the Milwaukee Public Museum. She's a research curator there. And she'll be talking about moths and bats and predation of um, bats upon moths. So that should be a really fun and scientific discussion. Um, I'm really excited to meet with her. She's been really nice to meet um, in person, but she'll be joining us on Zoom again. Um, all right, Greg, if you have time, we have three more questions that popped up in chat. Okay. So um, Karen asked, why would the phosphorus be so high when the um, potassium and nitrogen were so low? It's, it's, a, it's a very good question. And one that um, I actually went back to the, uh, the soil test lab that, that I sent the tests into. Um, a lot of it, when I, and I, I don't have the full history of the farm. Um, but one of the thoughts was, is that before that area, the community garden became garden plots, whatever was in there, whether it be pasture 
or if there was livestock of some type, that there was manure buildup. Um, it, it, it's, it's all just kind of um, theory right now, but those two factors were the two that seemed to make the most sense to me on the phosphorus levels. Um, parent material, what the, I mean, what the, the rocks and minerals that make up the soil at the farm could have something to do with it. But we think that it was probably the pre, you know, within the past 25 to 30 years, what went on in that area. Again, maybe they had livestock, maybe it was a pasture, something like that. But um, th those were the best, best answers we could come up with on the phosphorus. That's a great question. Yeah, and the farm does have a long history, so there's certain yeah. different influences there. Um, Pam asked, when you mentioned biologics and inoculants, what are you considering as organic? Well, um, I mean, pretty much any of the inoculants or biologics are going to be organic. Um, they're a source of microbial activity. Um, I'm not a real expert. As I said, a lot of this has just really come to being, but most of them are made out of some type of bacteria. And um, if, if, you can, if you can give me her contact information, I'll follow up more with her. But my understanding for the most part on these new biologicals that are coming out, most of them are, are made out of some type of bacteria that the microbial organisms in the soil thrive on. And so I would can put them all under the realm of, of organic. Now there may be something out there because as I said, there's companies now that have just uh, raised from nothing that that's now all they're into. And, and I, I kind of have to talk about them with a little word of caution that all of them have been researched, um, you know, the way I'd like to see in order to, I mean, let me give you an example. I was, uh, I was up in an orchard in Bayfield earlier this spring and I got coerced into helping them plant apple trees, um, brand new apple trees. And of the 130 plus apple trees that we planted, he gave me a small bag, which is probably two cups of an inoculant with just a, I don't even know what to explain, how to explain it, but it'd be almost the size of a pencil that I put into that package and I would just, he wanted that sprinkled on the roots of those trees that we were growing. And his, he had some trees that had been planted last year that they ran out of inoculant. So these were two year old trees. And all he had to do was point out and ask me, which ones of those do you think were inoculated and which ones weren't? And I, I couldn't believe that two-year-old trees you could see that much of a difference um, but that little two cup bag of inoculant was a thousand dollars so we were extremely careful on how much we were and how we put it on those roots but when I took a look at the, the um, untreated and the treated trees from a year ago it's obviously doing something so um, there are, those, those products are out there, is what I'm trying to say. Thanks. One more quick question. Um, what is the cost of a soil test and why would a compost test be more? Um, well, first of all, uh, the, the price of a soil test will roughly run you 18 to $20 a sample. Um, when you think about the whole realm of things and what you learn from it, that's the best investment that you can make. The, as I mentioned, the price of the compost, um, 
uh, test was $82. And the results that I got back from the compost test, it was, it was four pages long. The amount of chemis chemistry that they have to do in the lab uh, to be able to draw out and extract those nutrients is significant and the amount of time it takes. In a normal soil test, you can send it in and within two weeks, you should get your soil test back. With that compost, it took me three months before I got the results back. Because of the, the procedure is, is such a lengthy procedure. So part of it is the amount of time and also the chemical extracts that they need to use in order to get the information on what the nutrient level is on compost. 